So people are very upset with millennials right now saying that we are raising Gen Alpha, who is the worst generation yet. I need to ask millennials, um, why are your kids so awful? And more importantly, why do you think it's so funny? Your kids cannot read. They cannot write. They are ill-mannered. And they're monsters. Hi everybody, my name is Mrs. Shelton and I'm a third grade educator. Um, I'm currently hiding under my desk because your kids suck so bad. I need everybody else in my generation to promise that we are not gonna raise iPad children, please. Your kids can't read, okay? You're raising Gen Alpha. They're bizarre and terribly behaved. Y'all bred iPad children. You have been shoving media and screens in these kids' faces since birth. Young Gen Z teachers are talking about the poor behavior of Gen Alpha students, and some of y'all are finally starting to believe us when it comes to how much we've missed the mark on raising these kids right. Some pretty strong statements are being made about the horrors of Gen Alpha and how it's all millennials' fault. And I wanna talk about it, see if there's any validity behind it. To preface this, I am a parent of two Gen Alpha kids and I was born in 95, so I'm technically a millennial, but I'm on the younger end, that border of kind of almost Gen Z, but I think I still am technically a millennial. So I got to experience all the other millennials raise their kids before I took a stab at it. If you haven't heard of Gen Alpha yet, they are the newest generation of kids ages or born 2010 to 2025, I'm pretty sure. And this means that for the majority, it is millennials raising them with the outlier of Gen X or some Gen Z's who had kids young. So something clearly has gone wrong with these kids seeing that everyone from these Gen Z influencers to teachers coming forward to talk about the troubles they're having with Gen Alpha. So we're gonna go over these topics and see what's behind all the issues coming up. But before we get into how millennials are raising these little terrors, I do need to talk about today's sponsor who is AG1. You guys know I've been loving AG1 for months now and Josh has been on AG1 for over a year. Even with the state of the world and having to cut corners really prioritize our budget. We're still prioritizing purchasing AG1 because we've seen such a difference in Josh's life, in his gut health, in how he sleeps at night. Like I've said before, Josh was dealing with some health issues a couple years ago and the doctors were not very helpful. So we decided to take the approach of addressing what he puts in his body to try and balance his gut. And AG1 was a top choice for that. Just seeing all the reviews online. If you haven't heard of AG1 before, it is a science-driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source nutrients that aid your brain, gut, and immune system. It was made to fill nutrient gaps, promote gut health, and support whole body vitality. Just a daily scoop of AG1 mixed with water delivers a powerful blend of health products working together to help you feel like your healthiest self. We love AG1 because it replaces all the multivitamins and other vitamins we were taking to try and supplement our lives. And on top of that, it has the probiotics and the superfoods. I myself have noticed a boost in energy whenever I take this. I like to have it kind of midday, early afternoon um, to just get me through that slump of the day, but it doesn't give me that caffeine crash that a cup of coffee otherwise would. I really enjoy the taste of it. I know people can be scared because it's green, but it actually tastes really tropical. They have pineapple core in it. I like adding lemon juice and it's just such a nice refreshing drink. I never forget to have it because I look forward to it every day. So if you guys would like to try out AG1 and see what benefits you find in your life, head to the link in my description description, that link will get you a free one-year supply of vitamin D plus K3, as well as five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. Thank you so much to AG1 for being a sponsor of today's video. Now let's talk about Gen Alpha. First, let's talk about Gen Alpha's overall behavior. Having to teach and work with you guys as children has been the most traumatic experience of my life. They don't respect any authority. You ask them, can you stand in your designated spot? They're telling you no and shut up. But I've also noticed kids are getting so mean. <laughs> I have some students who are just so brutally honest that it hurts my feelings and I'm getting my feelings hurt by like a 12 year old. Oh, hello. Are you a little bunny? I smell fear on you. Okay, I don't like that one. When I first came across these TikToks about Gen Alpha's behavior problems, I honestly didn't think much about it because, you know, kids can suck, <laughs> kids can be the worst, but also, Millennials have always been hated on and it just felt like another episode of that. On top of that, every new generation is 
always talked about as being the worst generation yet, the worst behaved, the worst attitudes. So it just felt like nothing new. But then I started hearing about teachers who have been teaching for like a decade or more are now quitting because of the new generation. And that really spiked my interest. In fact, a 2022 survey of 615 K through 12 teachers who left the profession cited poor student behavior as the number one reason for their departure. So there is reason to believe that these kids Kids do have behavior issues, but what is causing it? It seems like everyone's screaming from the rooftops that it's all millennials' fault for the chosen parenting styles that they use. Specifically, gentle parenting is the villain here, and if you don't know me, I do gentle parent. I do want to put that out there, just that I do have a little bit of a bias towards it. I wouldn't be a millennial parent if I wasn't gentle parenting. <laughs> if you don't know what gentle parenting is, it advocates for using non-violent methods of discipline, such as redirection, positive reinforcement, and natural consequences, rather than physical or emotional punishment. It's centered around partnership in parenthood and collaborating with your child. And I do want to talk about why millennials have gravitated towards this parenting style. It's a common theme that every gen generation will kind of rebel against the previous generation's parenting style to try and do better for their own kids. Whether it's intentional or not, people will look back on their own childhood and say, I like this, I don't like that, I'm going to change the things that I didn't like about my childhood the way I was raised. And so Gen X, the millennials' parents, were the generation of helicopter parents and being super strict and disciplined. They're known for meeting the physical needs of their kids, but not even acknowledging the emotional needs. Obviously, this is a generalization. Um, and that has led to millennials taking a softer approach to parenting. We're stereotypically hands-off, uh, don't like confrontation, want to be our children's best friend, and just don't want our kids to hate us at the end of the day. And people have been very vocal with the issues that are rise with this type of parenting. I'm a Gen Z who nannied and worked in childcare for like seven or so years. So I have a lot of hands-on experience with these nightmare Gen Alpha children. And I could always tell which parents right away were attempting to rely solely on gentle parenting approaches. I do love gentle parenting, don't get me wrong. However, you have to use gentle parenting along with other styles of parenting as well. It also teaches kids to set their own personal boundaries and that their voices should be heard out in the world. It's a very positive and uplifting style of parenting. But a lot of times these parents who wholeheartedly lean into these commercialized gentle parenting books fail at teaching a couple very important things. The first would be your actions have consequences, okay? We cannot just live a punishment-free lifestyle because that's not how the real world works. Every time I see these arguments about gentle parenting being so bad, I always think, but that's not really gentle parenting. That's not what I know as being the definition of gentle parenting. Most definitions of gentle parenting differ, but every definition I found online always include an emphasis on boundaries and the importance of natural consequences. It does to me seem like a misconception that everyone who gentle parents doesn't have boundaries or consequences, which leads to unruly children. And that's just never in the like rule book of what professionals and experts in the field say and teach about gentle parenting. So I think gentle parenting is often confused with permissive parenting. And I think a lot of people can understand and agree that permissive parenting is not good for your children. If you don't know what permissive parenting is, I found a definition that says it's a parenting style that involves high parental support, responsiveness, and nurturing with nominal structure or control. These parents make few demands of their children and enforce little punishment. Children of permissive parents may view their parents as easygoing, lenient, and fun. And this one creator I found, I think, gives perfect examples of the difference between gentle parenting and permissive parenting. Oh, sweetie, come on, no. I said that you can't touch her while you have your fever and everything else. Can you please just get up on the couch? Oh, you want someone to snuggle with? You want to snuggle with her? Oh, it's just so cute. Here, let me get a quick picture. Oh, you're such a good big sister. Okay, you want to snuggle with her, though? I really, I don't want you touching her face and her hands. You just want to feed her her bottle while you're sick. Okay, well, how about I go get it ready, and then I'll sit with you guys, and then you can feed her the bottle, but you really, please stop touching her face like you are. Hey, come on. No, I said you need to stop touching her face and her hands while you're sick. Now, get up on the couch. 
listen, I don't want her getting sick. We can't all be getting sick through this house. And I understand that you don't feel well. You want someone to snuggle with? Okay, I can snuggle with you in just a little bit. I have to finish up a couple more things. But sweetie, you're here with the TV. I need you to stay put on the couch. If you can't stay on the couch, I am gonna have to have you spend time in your room until I'm able to sit with you, okay? Because there are too many kids here in this house. I can't have everybody getting sick. I need you to cooperate, okay? And so we can leave the TV on, you can stay here. But if you if you keep on touching the babies, if you keep on touching everyone and putting your mouth on everything, I'm gonna have to send you to your room to spend time there. An article that I found lays out the negative effects of permissive parenting, which includes bad manners, impulsiveness, aggression, lack of boundaries, anxiety and depression, and selfishness. Now, as much as I wanna say, we all know this is a bad parenting style, there's obviously still people who are doing it, otherwise there wouldn't be articles about it. But here's what I'll say, I, agree with these creators who are saying millennials parenting like this are not doing a great job, but I think that they're mislabeling millennials as bad parents overall. While gentle parenting is a huge trend right now and permissive parenting is like having its moment, I just have a hard time believing that the whole generation of Gen Alpha is screwed up from this when we're all parenting differently. I hear this all the time in the world of gentle parenting that people will label themselves as a gentle parent, but pick and choose pieces they like, pieces they don't. Uh, some gentle parents will spank. You could argue that's not gentle parenting, uh, use timeouts, some will use unrelated consequences, and of course you'll have some authoritative parents in there who are really strict and physical with their punishments. This study of 200 parents with children's ages 1 to 5 were surveyed and found that 63% of parents were using authoritative parenting style, that's gentle parenting, 17% were using authoritarian parenting style, and 20% were using permissive parenting styles. So this shows that while permissive parenting is popular with millennials, it is not the majority. And if we're saying that permissive parenting is the problem causing these behavior issues with children, then it just doesn't add up that all the children would have bad behavior from 17% of permissive parents. I just feel like with such a variety in parenting styles, we can't all be producing the same children. With all that being said, I would say gentle parenting isn't the issue. Millennials' parenting choices aren't the issue because, and I guess this isn't a great example, but like everyone I know online, offline, uses boundaries and consequences with their children. I think it does take a lot of mental energy to not have any boundaries for your kids, but that's besides the point. But at the end of the day, I'm not the one dealing with Gen Alpha and they definitely are having behavioral issues. So something's causing it. And if it's not their parenting style, we have to find um, something else that's causing it. But let's switch gears and talk about how kids can't read. Did you know that kids can't read? Because I had no idea. I am a first year high school English teacher. This is definitely going to be my first and last year teaching. It is absolutely astonishing and scary how your kids are 14, 15 years old and still do not have the proper reading skills. And I'm not talking about the ESC kids, the 504s, the, e, uh, the IEP kids. I'm talking about your everyday regular Joe Schmo from Kokomo kid who does not know how to read and right at the level that they should. But I don't understand why they not stressing to y'all how bad it is. Like, I'm not even trying to be funny, but these kids are, I'ma just say this. I teach seventh grade, they are still performing on the fourth grade level. These kids can't read, they can't decode. They have no vocabulary, no background knowledge. I've never seen anything like it. For context, for eight years, I taught um, a self-contained program for significant language-based learning disabilities. Like it was the most restrictive environment. It was the step before being sent to a specialized school. And my fifth graders with significant language-based learning disabilities could write better than non-disabled seventh graders can now. One of the most basic, most important skills you learn in school and children don't know how to do it. As it turns out, about one third of American children can't read at grade level. And I also looked it up in Canada because I'm Canadian and I know we adopt a lot of the practices from America. And of course in Canada, we're not much better. <laughs> the Toronto District School Board, Canada's largest, revealed 30% of kids in grade one were not meeting reading expectations in June of 2022, a six point increase compared to the end of the 2013 
2013 school year. Before I start sharing what I found, I do want to talk about a podcast, Sold a Story by Emily Hanford. I got most of my information from her. It's a very in-depth, well-rounded podcast, the full story of why kids can't read. So I would highly suggest you go check her out, check out the podcast if you want more information after this. And what I found was super interesting in that the fault is not on the children, or on the parents, it's actually on the education system itself. As it turns out, districts across the country stopped teaching phonics in the early 2000s and began to teach children to identify words by sight and memorization. This process is called the three cueing method, where they're encouraged to guess words from the context of the sentence. And as you can tell, there's no actual reading involved, no sounding it out, no phonics. Okay, so we're gonna stop right here on this covered word. We're gonna see if the picture helps us to figure out what that word would be. Do you think that covered word could be the word miss? Because now that they're gone, maybe their parents will miss them? Let's do our triple check and see. Does it make sense? Does it sound right? How about the last part of our triple check? Does it look right? Let's uncover the word and see if it looks right. It looks right too. Good job, very good job. It also isn't really the teacher's fault either because they were told this is the new, best, most effective way to teach children. The idea was that if you just get books into the children's hands, they will pick it up and learn naturally. In a similar way that you would teach a toddler language, it's ingrained in us, like part of our brain, to learn how to speak, so all they need to do is be exposed to people speaking and they'll pick up on it naturally. For some children, this method did work and eventually they pick up the patterns of the words and the sentence structure. But as we know, for a lot of children, this does not work. The most popular literacy program in the country at the time was by Lucy Calkins. It is called the Units of Study in Reading and Writing. She became a sort of celebrity in the schooling world as she sparked a new light in the reading world, making it fun for kids again and leaving the art archaic phonic ways. She believed that children were natural readers and just needed exposure to books and saw phonics as unnecessary and that they deterred children from actually wanting to read. As one person put it, she's essentially asking teachers to throw kids in the deep end of the pool and tell them they're swimmers and let them sink. A lot of the criticism I'm hearing about millennials impact on these reading issues is that parents should be more involved in your child's schooling and shouldn't have let their kids go on so long without knowing how to read. For one, I personally don't think it's a crime to send your kid to school and assume they're gonna learn how to read. <laughs> but the real problem is that a lot of parents had no idea their children couldn't read. The teachers were sending kids home with books to read and practice at home that they had already memorized in the classroom. And since the school's requirements of reading was based on memorization and guessing, whenever they were tested for it, if they guessed right, memorized correctly, they got report cards coming home saying they're excelling with flying colors, no issues, your, your child's doing great. So why would a parent assume things weren't going great? But the school said he was doing great. They were telling me he was doing fine. They were telling me he was on level. When Charlie did well on something in school, the teacher would send home a little note. And he would get them all the time for like, great reading. He would get him in his little backpack and I'd be like, oh, you're doing so great. And for a lot of parents, it wasn't until 2020 when they had to do school at home that these parents actually saw firsthand that their kids couldn't read. To fast forward, there still is some teaching of the three cueing method, but there has been a lot of pushback. More than a dozen states have passed laws pushing phonics, and three states have actually banned the use of three cueing system. This graph shows what states have mandated, the science of learning curriculum, and that curriculum puts the emphasis on phonics. So all that being said, I do think there is an epidemic of kids who don't know how to read. That's a real problem. I just don't think it's the parents' fault. Also, with all this information coming out, a lot of parents are way more informed about the issue and now are getting more involved in their child's learning, trying to supplement them to catch up. Seeing that it is such an important life skill, uh, if not the most important thing you learn in elementary school, I can't imagine parents just brushing this off and just not caring. Moving on, let's talk about the dreaded iPad kids. I am definitely not the first person to say this, but oh my God, don't give a baby an iPad. I saw this post. We left my iPad brother in the restaurant to see if he noticed. His entire family got up and left him and he didn't even realize. Like their attention span is already this big. They're not even aware of their surroundings. That's how in tune he is with his iPad. Last year I taught kindergarten, right? Guess how many of them had phones? About half of the class. <laughs> 
So I have a really hard time talking about topics like this because I don't feel good shaming parents when I don't know their reasoning behind their choices. For example, there are studies coming out saying that screen time can actually be helpful for children with autism as it helps their kids communicate, develop social skills, enhance their ability to learn and even alleviate anxiety. That being said, I think I can safely say that for most children, unregulated screen time is bad and we should not be doing that. I also don't think it's too crazy to say that the optimal situation would be no screen time at all, but is that realistic? I'm not sure. I mean, I use screen time with my kids. If I need to catch up on work, I'll put on an hour of a show, or if we're learning about a new subject, I'll put on a little video about it to give visual examples. But the goal for us personally is no screen time most days. The American Academy of Children, what is this? The A. <laughs> What is the AACIP? American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychology, that's a big acronym, recommends for children ages two to five to limit non-educational screen time to about one hour per weekday and three hours on the weekends, which I find is weird. Like, I feel like it makes sense to do less screen time on the weekends because you're all together, but whatever. And for ages six and older, encourage healthy habits and limit activities that include screens. But as it turns out, a massive 78% of kids stare at a screen for over three hours a day and more specifically, on average, children ages 8 to 12 in the United States spend four to six hours a day watching or using screens, and teens spend up to nine hours. Sounds like a lot. It kind of makes sense for the older ages specifically when you throw just regular TV shows into the mix, and a lot of teenagers have a cell phone, but nine hours is a lot. And screen time is also the most popular way that kids play in general now. Even though we all knew that screen time for kids was out of control, I do still find these statistics quite disturbing, especially when we look back on our own childhood and we think of playing outside, playing with our friends, doing crafts, playing in mud, all those fond memories of the joys of childhood and thinking that these children coming up potentially aren't getting that. Quite sad. Something that I find interesting is that the iPad came out in 2010, which is the start of the Gen Alpha generation. And I don't know if that is a coincidence or if that was the cultural shift that separated Gen Alpha from Gen Z. Keep in mind, if you don't know, these generations are all made up. <laughs> There's no like rules of when one starts and another ends, but someone came up with the 2010 date and I wonder if it has something to do with the iPad. A 2011 study found that 39% of two to four year olds have direct access to digital media just a year after the iPad's inception. From 2011 to 2013, the percentage of children under eight that were using digital media increased from 38% to 72%. In a way that makes sense as the iPad is like the ultimate toy for a child, just endless stimulation and colorful visuals and loud noises all on a device that they are able to use themselves. But I do wonder the parents at the time when the iPad first came out, did they ever question like, is this actually good for my child? Is it bad? Uh, did they see the implications at the time that it was muting the children's emotions? Just thoughts. So now let's get into the effects of unregulated screen time. There are multiple studies on the topic, but this one in particular that I found is from 2016, and it was created using nearly 12,000 children ages nine to 12. Parents self-reported on the children's emotional and behavioral syndromes in relationship to screen time. They concluded that time spent in various screen time types was positively associated with behavior problems. Watching television slash movies was associated with a 5.9% increase in rule breaking, 5% increase in social problems, 4% increase in aggressive behavior, and 3.7% increase in thought problems. I also wanted to add in their concluding statement. Those responsible for ensuring the healthy development of children should pay close attention to how much time young people spend on digital screens, as well as the type of screen content they are exposed to. In some, perhaps erring on the side of caution is the most reasonable approach in the current screen time debate. And there are many studies like that with similar outcomes. With these findings, I think it can help explain some of the aggression issues that teachers are talking about. If you've been on the Gen Alpha side of TikTok, it's actually really uncomfortable seeing all the physical abuse that teachers are going through from these children. It's not to say that all screen time is bad though. There are studies saying that viewing content with others is actually linked to greater language skills. Sorry, I keep having to check on Rook. <laughs> 
And I think part of the reason why screen time isn't taken out of these guidelines altogether is that there are some positive effects of screen time, like the educational programs or bonding time with your family. Like we all grew up with family movie nights. I've also been hearing a lot of people say that screen time is not bad for kids and it's just the same as we grew up watching a lot of TV but I disagree. I just don't think that watching TV is equivalent to iPad use. iPads provide that continuous stimulation, overstimulation, and the option to always be switching between videos and never finish something before you move on to the other. And I really think that does have an effect on children's attention span. If you've ever watched a young child use an iPad, you'll see that they never stay on one thing for longer than a minute. They're always finding the next like dopamine rush, in my experience anyways. I just don't think it's a fair comparison talking about these high high stimulation iPads versus sitting down to watch your one TV show uh, if it was on when you got your TV time and you weren't able to binge watch shows the same way. And circling back to parenting styles, I think these children with unlimited screen time, it doesn't even matter so much how the parent decides to parent their children because whenever there's a hiccup, there's conflict, there's just an issue, it's resolved with the iPad. Again, this isn't every parent, but there are parents like this out there. So the children are getting their emotional regulation from the iPad, not their parents. This means they're getting no coping mechanisms for the real world and once they enter school and they don't have the iPad to lean back on whenever they have high emotions, they don't know how to handle themselves and act out because of it. These are just my assumptions, but it makes sense in my head. Lastly, I do want to say I don't think it's as easy as just Gen Z saying we're not going to raise iPad kids, right? Not because I think we're all doomed to give our kids iPads, but the issue just runs so much deeper. Us as adults are addicted to our phones and it's just as bad for Gen Z. And I'm not trying to shame Gen Z for this. It's an issue that we're all dealing with. It's just that when you yourself are addicted to your phone, your children are gonna pick up on it. They're little sponges, they do what they see, and they're gonna see whenever you're bored, whenever you need a dopamine hit, you go to your phone. So what are children gonna do when they get access to that type of technology as well? I just feel like if we can't control our own screen time, there's no hope for the children. And I am just as guilty. Like I am going through the efforts of trying to reduce my screen time because it is made to addict us. Our phones are always sending us alerts trying to get our attention, and it takes a lot of intentionality to try and keep it away. I know I said that was my final thought but one final final thought is I don't think iPads are the devil I don't think you're a bad parent if you have an iPad if you use an iPad I just think it's all about regulation and creating a balanced life for your child here's the thing something I think a lot of these videos are completely leaving out about the issues with behavior and education of these children is the effect of the pandemic I do hear some teachers talking about it but for the most part it's them saying it can't just be the pandemic these kids are crazy we need to stop just making the excuse of the pandemic for the kids. I really think that's not fair. We as adults are still trying to navigate the new post-2020 world and manage our emotional trauma from those years, yet we have no sympathy for the youngest generation of kids who went through that. These kids were deprived of social interaction, were told not to touch people, that people outside of your circle can hurt you. They were out of their classroom teacher-student dynamic for over a year, and we're mad at them for not keeping up. I don't wanna get into the drama or the controversy of those years. I'm just talking about the effect that it did in fact have on these children. Children that go through trauma have emotional, physical outbursts because of it. There just really should be the most grace for these young kids out of everyone for what they had to go through. A clinical psychologist, Kennedy Moore, said lockdown had led to many children being less able to deal with conflicts and the normal bumps and bruises of interacting with other people because they had less practice with it. Spending their developmental years separated from their peers could become one of the defining and uniting experiences of the generation. A 2022 U.S. National Healthcare Quality and Disparities report suggested that nearly 20% of children aged 3 to 17 had a mental, emotional, developmental, or behavioral disorder. An Emergency department visits for children aged 5 to 11 relating to mental health increased by 24% from 2019 to March-October 2020. Children feeling safe and having something that they know to be true as security is so important to them. And these children were robbed of their sense of safety and security. This isn't something that I had written down to talk about, but it's something that I have looked into a lot as a parent, the effect that divorce can have on kids not saying divorce is bad always, um, but a child needs to have a safe place, have something that they can lean back on to always be there for them. And 
parents splitting up can kind of break that trust in safety for children. So when you have family members that were once safe and now they're being told, don't touch them, don't go near them, they'll make you sick, uh, can really mess with a child. And if they're told to question that one thing that they were originally told is safe and secure, you can rely on that, they'll start to wonder what else isn't safe and secure. What else should I worry about losing safety and security wise? I just think we need to have way more empathy for these children. They need a lot more time to recover from the pandemic and relearn their safety nets. So that was a lot to go over. Um, and you're probably gonna tell me that I was way too soft on millennials and that I'm biased because I'm a millennial myself, but I stand behind what I said, <laughs> unless you prove me wrong. I just don't think we're royally screwing up our children, at least intentionally. That being said, I do think these children are quite screwed up. <laughs> Here's the thing, there's always gonna be bad parents, whether it's the authoritative, Gen X, strict, physically abusive, the extreme, right, parent, or the permissive, emotionally abusive, extreme millennial parent. And I don't wanna disregard the teachers either coming forward talking about all these issues because they are the ones dealing with these kids firsthand. I really do think that screen time is a big issue. It's an issue for everyone, specifically the younger generation. I think we should be taking it very seriously and erring on the side of caution when maybe there's not enough studies out about the effects of this because it is so new. Permissive parents need to start getting it together and putting some boundaries up for those kids. And who knows, maybe all these people claiming to be gentle parents are actual permissive parents and so the stats are wrong and millennials are actually parenting their children in a bad way causing them to be emotionally dysregulated. I don't know, there's a lot at play. I just think we've been too hard on millennials but it's really not surprising as that's the only way we've ever been treated. <laughs> Just a reminder, make sure to head to the link in the description below to get that free one year supply of AG Vitamin D3 plus K2, plus the free travel packs with your purchase of AG1.